According to Roman legend, the Trojan hero Aeneas led the survivors of his fallen city of Troy, destroyed by the Greeks, to Italy to rebuild and begin a new life for his people. But no sooner had Aeneas landed his ships on the shore of Italy than he found himself at war against its rulers, accused of coming to steal their land. And so, in desperate need of help in this new war, he traveled to the little city of Palantium, a town of immigrants from Arcadia in Greece, who had settled along a river called the Tiber. The Trojan hero came to this town, asking for their aid, but little did Aeneas know that the site of humble Palantium would one day, some four centuries later, be chosen by his own twin descendants, Romulus and Remus, for a new city on that very spot called Rome. But long before Romulus and Remus, and even before the arrival of Aeneas to that town, Palantium had already been the host of a legendary hero, and the townspeople had a tale of their own to tell, a story of a fiendish, bloodthirsty monster, and the wandering champion who slew this beast and saved them all, a champion no less than the famous Hercules. After Aeneas sailed down the Tiber and found the little town on its banks, they say that he was welcomed as an honored guest by the king of Palantium, a man named Evander. As fate would have it, Aeneas had come on the very day that the townsfolk were celebrating the memory of Hercules, the great savior of their home and the god to whom they prayed, who had killed the monster that threatened them all. Sacrifices were made at the altar built for the hero, and a rustic feast was held. And when everyone there had eaten and drunk their fill, the kindly King Evander stood up before the guest Aeneas and all present. It was time to tell again the solemn tale of their salvation, when the demigod had slain the monster, the reason for their joyous festival. The townspeople sat in rapt attention, the Trojan Aeneas along with them. And Evander's story, they say, was this. Hero of Troy, our honored guest and friend, the king began, gesturing warmly to Aeneas. You must be wondering what all of these rites and honors are really for. We all know, of course, that Hercules is the mightiest of all, the true son of Jupiter who reigns above. But why do we here, in this little town of ours beside the Tiber, Send up so many prayers and sacrifices on this day. It's more than just superstition for us, you know. We do this because we, the people of Palantium, were saved by Hercules himself from death and ruin. As our savior, we remember him and celebrate his victory in this place year after year. Look here, Aeneas where I'm pointing. Over there, on that rocky hill we call the Aventine, there's a cliff that juts out, that heap of broken rubble. On that very spot, not so long ago, there was a cave that ran down deep into the cold earth, so far below that the sun's light could never reach inside. In this pit of darkness there lived a creature, half human, half monster, a hideous offspring of the smithing god Vulcan, whose form was massive like a beast's, and he breathed the god's own seething fire from his throat. They called him Cacus, and he was a foul, hateful creature who took pleasure in blood and savagery. The floor of his gloomy lair, 
under those rocks was stained with what was left of his poor victims, and he would nail up their rotting heads outside his cave like trophies to decorate his door, oozing and decaying on the cliffside. Now, for too long, our people lived in terror of this bloody, fire-breathing beast that stalked the hills. But at last, our desperate prayers were answered, and there came through our little town the great hero himself, the lordly Hercules, finally a champion with the might to end Cacus and rescue our town. They say that Hercules was on his way from Spain to the west, fresh from his journey to steal the cattle of Geryon. Now Geryon, you know, they say he was a demon with three bodies, and Hercules slew him thrice to take his herd as victory spoils, and he was leading them back to his own land in Greece. Hercules sought after a calf who broke off Geryon's herd, and went south, down through this land of Italy. And so it happened that this great hero, second only to the gods, should visit here our humble town on the Tiber. But of course, there was Cacus, the beast, who didn't let Hercules pass without a challenge. So mad was he, so wicked, that he picked a fight with our champion. He found where old Geryon's herd was kept, and stole four of Hercules's bulls and four of his cattle, the finest of the lot. And thinking himself so clever when he brought them back to his lair, he led them away backward, pulling them by the tail all around to his cave to confuse the tracks of their hooves. And when he got to his lair, he locked his new prizes up in the cold gloom beneath those cliffs. But that monster underestimated our Hercules. When the demigod came back to his herd, he found the ones that were left lowing and bellowing, sounding out all through the hills. And far away, deep within that evil cave, just faintly heard one of the stolen cattle was answering their call. Hercules heard that lowing from the rocky cliff, and a rage to rival all the wrath of Olympus flamed up in him like a sweeping fire. Anger and justice were his, and he was ready to deal bloody vengeance to the thief. He snatched up his giant club, famed in all the world, and he lunged away to the cliffs. We, at the edge of town, looked on in wonder at the scene as it unfolded, the indomitable Hercules storming the monster's lair. And we spotted Cacus up there too, like we'd never ever seen him before, absolutely petrified as Hercules headed straight for him. He turned tail, and disappeared into his cave to cower inside, and he barricaded the entrance with a giant boulder. But Hercules was there now, himself a furious beast, casting glances around the cliffs to look for a way in. He shook his huge club studded with big knots, a weapon ready to smash any foe to pieces. Then he took off, racing three times around the whole Aventine Hill where Cacus had his cave. But try as he might, he couldn't find a way inside. He attacked the barricaded opening once, twice, three times, but he couldn't get through the boulder. But then he spied a big jagged crag that rose straight up behind the cave, something he could get his mighty arms around. So he leapt up, grabbed hold of the rock, and put all his muscle and fury into it, shaking it, rocking the huge crag back and forth. With booming cracks and rumbles, 
The hill quaked as our hero ripped the crag out of the cliff by the roots, heaved it up in his massive arms, and hurled it aside to the ground with a deafening noise that shook us all the way in town. When Hercules tore it away, a shower of stone collapsed from the cliffside and revealed what lay within, flooding the hidden evil of Cacus's cave with the light of day. It was as if the very kingdom of Hades was laid bare for the first time. Now Hercules caught sight of the demon inside his lair and marked him for dead. Clutching big rocks and tree branches, he hurled them down from above like weapons, and Cacus was trapped. But then the monster drew in a great breath and vomited forth thick black smoke and blinding flame that enveloped the whole place in a fiery cloud, dark as night. Hercules could tolerate this creature hiding himself no longer. He leapt headlong through the black billows and flames into the cave, and even while Cacus belched out his searing fire, Hercules grabbed him by the throat with both hands. The monster's flame sputtered out as Hercules squeezed and squeezed until the eyes bulged and that hideous face was drained lifeless of every drop of blood. We all stood silent as we watched, as the smoke billowed from Cacus's ruined lair. And then, a miraculous sight we saw. The cave burst open, and out shambled the four bulls and four cows the robber had stolen, followed by the invincible hero himself, dragging behind him the corpse of our hated foe. Cacus was no more, and Hercules, our savior, had won our everlasting honor. In the aftermath of that battle, we feasted our eyes on the malformed shape of the monster, his frightful eyes and his shaggy, half-human chest. So this, noble Aeneas, prince of Troy, this is why we celebrate our God and Savior today, our champion, our liberator from fear and death, who gave our community new life and allowed us to thrive out from under the shadow of the beast. We honor Hercules each year with these rites at this altar of ours, which we call the greatest of altars, and the greatest it shall be forever. Come now, all of you, hail the champion, the savior of our new land here on the Tiber's banks. Wreathe your hair and pour your wine to the glory of the god who was mine and yours. Libations were poured, hymns were sung, and a treaty was struck between the Trojan Aeneas and the people of King Evander, who would support him in the battles to come. Resounding far past that mythical day in the rustic town of Palantium, to the future imperial capital of Rome that would rise on that very site, the glory of Hercules would remain in the heart of Italy. Annual honors would be paid to the hero and god each August at the greatest altar, the Ara Maxima, which poets and antiquarians wove into Roman myth, rooting its foundation in the ancient age of old King Evander. In Rome, Hercules became a role model whose image and deeds were put to good use in the propaganda of generals, politicians, and emperors who likened their own heroic exploits to his. The Roman descendants of Aeneas admired the Hercules who traversed the known world, slew monstrous foes, protected order from the forces of chaos, and imposed his will 
with unstoppable might. A fitting hero for an empire.